Our next presentation is going to be by Dr. Dwight Hoover, who is director of the Center for Middletown Studies. Uh, Dr. Hoover is going to talk a little bit about Muncie and about a concept that most of us really don't know, the concept of Middletown. Thank you. I'm going to do several things in my presentation. We agreed when we discussed what we were going to do that we would start with Frank, who would do the most general, and then switch the program order so that I would come last in uh, the series on uh, Main Street uh, after Frank since I would deal with the most specific area. What I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about why Muncie is Middletown and then talk about the development of Main Street in Muncie. I have a few slides. Fortunately these slides are uh, photographs of Muncie in the early 20th century. Some most of them in the 1920s. I'll be doing those toward the end. And we can regard this as a kind of preview of your tour tomorrow. Muncie has earned the sobriquet of the typical American town. It was not always so. It uh, actually became Middletown in the 1920s. I'd like to discuss how it became Middletown and then talk about uh, the evolution of the downtown area in a historic sense. The man to blame for Muncie becoming Middletown is John D. Rockefeller. Actually, it's his son, John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Rockefeller uh, tried to spend some of the money that his father had made. He was interested in philanthropic uh, uh, ventures. He himself had been quite upset by the Cripple Creek strike in 1914 and tried to think of a way to make uh, uh, social relations in the United States more harmonious. Uh, and during World War I, he had actually participated in some uh, funded efforts to uh, help the war effort. He was impressed by this and as a result got involved in a movement called the Interchurch World Movement which began in 1919. This movement was designed as an early ecumenical movement to unify all the Protestant churches in America. It was designed to uh, do this based upon particular research into the social and economic and religious preferences of the American public. There was an ambitious fundraising drive and a number of surveys were commissioned surveys of various communities. By 1920, however, can I uh, dispense with this? Can you hear me? A little hard? Okay. By 1920, the interchurch world movement was bankrupt. It had failed to, in its fundraising attempts, and so Rockefeller retreated from it and agreed to sponsor a, uh, an organization which succeeded it called the Institute for Social and Religious Research. Now, the Institute for Social and Religious Research took as its first uh, priority a study of small cities. And what they were doing was carrying on the tradition of the interchurch world movement. In 1922, the Institute decided that it would, as its first priority and as a new organization, would fund the study of religion in a small town. The Institute had a group of advisors from philanthropic organizations, and they said that the town that should be selected should be an industrial town with a high proportion of foreign residents. Three days later, this was actually in November of 1922, the Institute approved the idea and suggested two possible towns, which might have become Middletown. These two were Springfield, Massachusetts, and Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Uh, they also, the Institute also selected a person to conduct the studies. This person was a well-known sociologist by the name of Professor Bailey, who taught at Northwestern. They commissioned him to proceed he was given the authority to draw up a short list of towns that might qualify and also to set up 
certain kinds of criteria. Now, what Bailey did was to reject immediately the two towns that the Institute had, had listed and drew up the following criteria, which I'll read to you. The town had to have between 25 and 50,000 inhabitants. Its population growth had to have exceeded 35% in the preceding decade. Three, it should be a, possess a history of at least one generation. That is, it couldn't have been a boom town. It had to have been in existence at least 20 years. That would have left out Gary, so on. Its growth should be accelerating. Five, it should be a county seat town, rapidly industrializing. It should have, this is number six, it sh or five, Six, it should possess very industries. It should have a tributary countryside on the rebound. Now, I'm not sure what uh, Bailey meant on the rebound. Uh, I assume he meant from perhaps an economic recession of the early 20s. It should contain varied foreign elements, and Bailey defined these as especially continental, by which he meant European immigrants and Negro. It should be geographically independent. It should not be a satellite or a suburban city. It should be related to the great industrial zone, which again is eastern manufacture. It should have railway and water transport. And it should be in the east, north, central portion of the United States. And it should be near the center of life of the United States. And finally, it should contain all the chief denominations extant in the United States. There are some 15 requirements that Bailey drew up. Now, if you note, uh, this already has severely limited the possibilities, far more than the original institute had proposed. Uh, but it really doesn't make any difference what Bailey said. He wasn't selected to do the study. That is, he was taken off the study uh, in uh, a few months. Before he was taken off, however, he had chosen these towns might be some that you uh, have lived in. He chose South Bend, Indiana, Flint, Lansing, Jackson, Kalamazoo, Muskegon, Michigan. He chose Rockford, Illinois, and Racine and Kenosha, Wisconsin. That was his short list. As you can see, they're all concentrated in the upper Midwest. I don't know why he took so many uh, cities in, uh, in Michigan. When he pre presented his list to the Institute, the Institute came back with another list. This was their list. South Bend, Indiana. South Bend, still in the running. Steubenville, Ohio. Kenosha, Wisconsin. Rockford, Illinois. And Jackson, Michigan. Uh, Jackson, Michigan wasn't on the Institute's list. Actually, they had chosen Warren, Ohio, but decided that two cities in Ohio was too much. Bailey started out to traveling around looking at these various towns and received word actually in July of 1923 that uh, he wasn't going to be the director anymore. The Institute had changed its mind and had selected a man named Robert Lind. Now it's curious as to why they made this change. Lind was born in Indiana, actually in New Albany. He was a banker's son who had gone to Princeton, graduated in 1914, had worked on newspapers for a time and, in, and with journals and had had a successful career when uh, at the end of World War I, that is in 1919, he decided to change his vocation and entered Union Theological Seminary. Uh, he was at the time in 1923 a new graduate of Union Theological Seminary. Professor Harvey uh, of Chico State speculates that the change was made because Lind in 1921 wrote an article critical of Standard Oil and its practices in Elk Basin, uh, Wyoming, and thus came to the attention of Rockefeller, who decided he wanted him to do the study. In any case, Lind, who had no reputation as a sociologist or as an anthropologist, whose only training had indeed been a theological training, was suddenly thrust in the position of uh, being the director of the study. 
Now, he did offer Professor Bailey the chance to continue as second in, com in command. Bailey refused the offer, and Lynn uh, then went ahead with his wife to start to select cities himself. He, again, took his own list and drew up these particular uh, cities. His major city, his first one, was South Bend. He went to South Bend, he looked at it, he decided there were two things that were going to create problems. It was too big, he thought, and it had too many foreign foreigners in it. Now, if you remember earlier, the Institute had wanted to have people of foreign extraction. Lind had decided that this complicated the study, so he proposed to the Institute that he study a portion of South Bend. He said, I can't do all of it, I'd like to do part of it. Uh, they reacted strongly against this and said no, they would not accept that. And between the two of them, they drew up this, this list. Actually, the list con uh, included Decatur, Illinois, Kokomo and Muncie, Indiana. That's the final short list. Uh, Lynn ver visited the various uh, areas and decided upon Muncie. So that's how he came to be chosen. It was a very long and tortuous process. Uh, the Lynns chose Muncie, uh, again adding several reasons to the uh, ones already set out by Bailey. Lynn, for example, and he says this in the preface to Middletown, that he didn't want a test of it. What he wanted was a community with very few uh, non-American born citizens or blacks. And let me indicate what other things he said he wanted in the community. And this is why Muncie qualified. He said he wanted a town with a substantial artistic life, which was not dependent upon any institution of higher learning. And please refrain from any comments. <laughs> he also added that he did not want a community that had any local problem, which I quote here, would mark it off from the mid-channel sort of American community. He said that the This view of Muncie appears in an Indiana Gas Company promo, which was put out in 1912. It's a seller's photograph. I'm not sure exactly uh, when it was taken. That's the old courthouse. Uh, this building here right behind the courthouse is interesting because that's where Lind had his office when he studied in Muncie. This is Walnut Street. Going down here, this would be the railroad tracks down here. This is Main Street. Going this way, the voice block would be down here. This is Mulberry. This would be Jefferson Street. This is the De old Delaware Hotel. This is the Presbyterian Church. McNaughton's would be the forum, or ball stores would be down in here somewhere. I'm not sure that's correct. Prior to the gas boom, there had been some development in Muncie. Most of this development. Uh, however, came after the gas boom started. Several of the buildings that were built uh, preceded. I think we have a picture of this one next. Let's see. No, this is a picture of a sidewalk scene in Muncie, again about 1910. 
and it illustrates the fact that uh, the sidewalks were considered part of the down of the downtown merchants uh, property and uh, were extended out over the street one of the early injunctions to the Muncie police force was to clear these structures off the street this is the big four uh, railway station a photograph taken uh, actually uh, before World War I. And this uh, defines the southern section of downtown Muncie. This is a building that was built in 1886. It's a Willard building. It was built uh, the year before the uh, gas boom occurred. Uh, you can't see this. Charles Coldwater, our local poet, has spoken of this because on a niche in the uh, building there is a statue of the builder's father, uh, Willard, Charles Willard Sr. Uh, the photograph, I think, dates uh, from the early 1900s. The police force was not formed until 1893. Uh, all of these people are policemen. Three of them are in plain clothes. Uh, one of them is, as you can see, in uniform. The gas boom did uh, encourage considerable building. Uh, one story that uh, occurs in Hambaugh's history is about Boyce himself. Uh, in uh, November, actually, of 1887, after gas had been discovered and promoters had come to town. Boyce was sitting in the Kirby Hotel with a number of other businessmen. One businessman said that he would give $60 a month to rent a ground floor office, but there were none to be had. Uh, Boyce pointed across the street at Maine and Jefferson and said that he could have a office building up in a week. Uh, the businessman scoffed at him and all agreed that if he could build it in a week, uh, they would take uh, uh, up the options. He started work on Monday, and the following Saturday, the building was built. Uh, evidently, hadn't didn't have many problems with building permits or <laughs> environmental impact statements or anything like that. The gas boom, however, had its greatest impact on Muncie in the decade of the 1900s, and I want to uh, say a little bit about that. Starting in the 1890s, the uh, construction of Main Street began. In 1892, the Weiser Grand Opera and the Heath Iron Building went up. This is the Weiser Grand Theater. Again, the, uh, the time is in the uh, 1920s. You can see uh, that uh, baby Peggy is showing in miles of smiles. Uh, it's possible to see uh, the stage entrance, which is right back there for the, uh, that's the stage entrance for the legitimate theater. The Weiser Grand Opera House was being used in the 1920s as a kind of combination theater and movie house. Uh, this crowd is lined up to go to uh, the movie. If you look down there, you can see just the beginnings of the Strand Theater. The two of them are on the, the same street. And the streets, uh, as you can see, are still unpaved. Now, in 1894, the streets were supposedly paved with asphalt. Uh, uh, remaining paving takes a good deal more time. In, in the decade of the 1900s, there were 13 buildings of considerable substance built. Commercial Club, the Johnson Building, the Cohen Building. Public Library was erected in 1902. Prior to that, the library had been located in City Hall on the second floor. In 1903, McNaughton, the leading department store in, in Muncie, was built. In 1905, the Weiser Building, not the theater, but the Weiser Building was built, the Masonic Temple.
bicycle underneath. And this, this is an ambulance taking people to the old home hospital. One of the comments uh, Lynn makes in Middletown is the fact that horses persist, or horse-drawn vehicles persist as vehicles of choice even after the automobile came in. And he commented on the fact that in the 1920s, if you went to the hospital or to the cemetery, you still went in a horse-drawn vehicle. It was preferred to an automotive. The, the streets in Muncie in the 1920s were perhaps the most congested of all. This is a glass plate negative that's cracked. Uh, it shows here uh, a collision between an uh, interurban car shipped by trolley, an interurban, that has crashed into the Presbyterian Church. Uh, this, would, this would be on Mulberry Street. This is a view of downtown Muncie in 1924. This is a view looking north. Uh, this is the Muncie Hotel, a hotel down by the railroad tracks. Hook's Drug Store. This would be Stillman's department store here. Although we can't see it, this would be uh, McNaughton's ball stores right here. You can see at this particular time from the uh, overhead wires, telephone poles, that the streetcars are still running. Another feature of Muncie development in the 1920s is adaptive reuse. One of the characteristics that the Lynns noted about Muncie in the 1920s was the growth of laundries. Indeed, the Lynns predicted in the 1920s that uh, the laundries would continue to grow and nobody would do laundry at home. And they noted that a great many people who had previously had servants no longer had them. This is actually Evers Laundry, you can see here. This is a scene on Walnut Street. And here are women who work in Evers Laundry uh, sitting in the window. I'm not sure why this picture was taken. Next to it, we have an Overland. The Overland was, as you know, if you're as old as I am, a predecessor of the Pontiac. And here is a downtown store that is now displaying a, uh, an Overland uh, automobile. One of the features of downtown Muncie in the 1920s was considerable occupation of down, downtown buildings. I'm not sure you can see that. That's an advertisement for old trails insurance. It's automobile insurance. The car is parked outside the building. Again, uh, this is, I think, on Washington Street. The office is on the second floor. Down, uh, the first floor is occupied by a florist shop. Typical of Muncie in the 1920s were a variety of small, privately owned uh, uh, clothing stores. Muncie had a very small Jewish population, but this population was uh, concentrated on Walnut Street. This is the Keller Company and uh, the best men's store in town, supposedly. And they're selling straw hats and canes. This would be 1924. Another uh, business is Ballard's Hardware. This is 207 North Walnut. I put this in because you can see the kinds of businesses that are advertised here on the side. Uh, Muncie then made uh, several automobiles. Billy Durant had a factory here. They made the Flint 6, the Durant. These plants were located south of the railroad tracks in what had been the interstate uh, car company. Campbell's Ice Cream, we've seen their factory. Uh, a local bakery, the Elks Cafe, Duco Paints, and so on. Uh, reflected in the window is a kerosene stove and an automobile of that vintage. 
This is Bernie Friend's clothing store, the Y, 523 South Walnut. Uh, Bernie says it was in the red light district. It was a working man's clothing store in a transitional area. Uh, it, uh, it actually was a fairly prosperous business. Shirts, sign says 5,000 shirts, 73 cents each. This is the final slide of this particular picture. This is a uh, bakery uh, sweet shop uh, somewhere again on Walnut Street. I put it in again because of its, its attempt to look like uh, home folks with uh, nice lace curtains and so on. The last few slides have shown Main Street that the Lynns found. They took this Main Street for granted. They, did, they do not comment in Middletown about the development of Main Street. They say very little about it. They're, they concentrate instead upon the industrial areas of Muncie. Uh, the reason why, I don't know. It may be that uh, for the Lynns, this was a familiar site. It may be that this is what they expected Muncie to look like. It's a main street I think most of us remember. It was not the product of slow evolution, as I've indicated, but rather the product of a sudden burst of economic activity stimulated in part by a gas boom. Its slow demise, which is happening now, is another story. Thank you. Questions? Quick promo, I have a slide tape show outside in which many of these slides and others are available to be seen if we get an extension cord. <laughs>